world. Hey there guys, Micah Curtis here and welcome back to the Comics Crusade. We are here again for the second week of July and if you missed it yesterday, I actually had the opportunity to have a discussion with none other than the legendary Chuck Dixon. In fact, just today, he and my amigo Timothy Lim have launched the Kickstarter for Trump's Space Force. So, if you would, please go ahead and have a look at it and if you think that it's worth backing, which I think it is, sadly I'm just broke right now, throw a little cash its way. And, you know, Tim of, the, Tim of course, is a great artist. Chuck is a freaking legend. So, and uh, from what we talked about yesterday, there's going to be a lot of fun and tongue-in-cheek humor in regards to it. So it, it sounds like it's going to be a great, you know, a, a great book. Uh, but you're probably wondering, though, why are we starting off Comics Crusade with Micah in the flesh as opposed to, you know, cartoon Micah? And the reason for that is this, is I have a favor to ask each and every one of you. You know, usually I open this with saying something about Patreon and stuff like that, and there have been changes on the Patreon front. I have set up goals so now that if you want to request a specific comic, if you decide to get put in $5 or more, then that's awesome. Thank you, and, you know, I'm going to make sure that your comic is reviewed every time that it comes up, as long as you're a patron. So... My thing is, is that today I have a, a favor to ask of the audience, and that is, if you are enjoying the series, please share it with everyone. Anyone you can get your hands on. If you're on Twitter, share it. If you're on Facebook, share it. If you have a Reddit account, throw it out there to somewhere. Throw it out to the main comic books board, DC, Marvel, or um, even Wortham in Action. Reason I ask is because, for better or worse, YouTube is for is really screwing me over when it comes to notifications from my videos. Sometimes I'll start seeing about 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 people watch a video, and then the next week nobody gets notified, and all of a sudden I'm getting all these complaints of, I never got a notification for such and such. So, for better or worse, YouTube is trying to kneecap me for reasons I don't understand. I'm going to email creator support and see what the hell is going on. And... If you could, do what you can to help out, because it would be greatly appreciated. Alright, enough of my ugly mug, let's go ahead and get to the comics. Red Hood and the Outlaws, number 24. You know what's unfortunate? We are, for better or worse, seeing the end of Red Hood and the Outlaws. After issue 25, it is going to simply be retitled The Red Hood. But from what I've heard, the creative team of Dexter Soy and Scott Lobdell on writing will stick around. What really kills me is the simple fact that this particular comic is writing the character of Jason Todd so well it's scary. If you can't tell by the tone of my voice, this is already not only a recommendation for me, but probably the best comic of the week. What I have to say is that what I read in this book, I joked a little bit about with the, you know, old school Pulp Fiction, I just shot Marvin in the face sort of joke. But what I love about this book, and what I love about what happens in it, is that it is bringing something good to an end by making sure that the characters play to exactly what we know of them, well, at least so far. In this, Jason Todd walks into a crowd of people, unmasks himself to the Penguin, and in vindication for what happened to his father, in going down for one of Penguin's schemes, basically. He reveals himself, and then shoots Oswald Cobblepot right in the face. Now, do I think that Penguin is dead? Probably not. Probably just lost his eye. But, yeah. Needless to say, kind of a huge move. And it's honestly kind of sad, because we see that Bizarro is no longer super smart Bizarro. He's gone back to being the dumb Bizarro that a lot of us grew up with. He's still hallucinating seeing the, his uh, toy Superman Pup Pup talking to him and trying to reassure him that things are going to be okay. And it honestly feels like uh, Bizarro in a weird way. I don't think that the writers are trying to insult the fans here, but they're using Artemis and Bizarro as sort of a stand-in for you the fan, because what's happening here is sad. Because Jason Todd has not killed a single person since the beginning of this arc, and he just snapped 
And then upon realizing what he's done, he also sees that this fortress that Bizarro had made when they were smart is crashing and self-destructing because his intelligence is gone. And the comic book ends with Batman realizing he has to go and he has to bring in Jason again. The reason that I love this comic so much is because it stirs a lot of the same emotions that Under the Red Hood did. And I mean the film. I'm planning on doing a video where I compare and contrast the comic book version, the film version, and then the video game Batman Arkham Knight, which is based on Under the Red Hood, and basically talking about the themes and how they tell the story and which one I prefer personally. And what I love about this and what I love about Batman's relationship with Jason Todd is that Jason, for better or worse, is the prodigal son. And that Bruce understands why Jason wants to go his own way, do his own thing, and do things his own way. But he always knows that Jason is walking a line between hero and anti-hero. And he could just as easily be a hero for the rest of his days, but he's always been emotional. He's always had an anger problem. And at this point, it has brought him to, I'm assuming, murdering the Penguin. There's something just ominous about the last page of Bruce getting up and Alfred saying, Master Bruce, with all my heart, I'm sorry it's come to this. It's, it's sad, but it's just it's very well written. I honestly think that this might end up being Scott Lobdell's best work of his career. And if you're not reading Red Hood and the Outlaws at this point, I don't know what to tell you. Definite recommendation. Again, best comic I've read all week. Flash number 50. So, there's only so much I can really say about The Flash. Especially this comic. Because, I'll be frank, I have no clue what was going on into this, necessarily. And I've read a couple issues in the lead-up. There's a lot of other forces that are getting introduced, such as the Sage Force, and the Strength Force, and so on and so forth. But for better or worse, what this is doing is re-establishing Hunter Zolomon into the rogues gallery of the Flash. And of course, helping to keep Wally West in the conversation as one of the Flashes. Here's my problem with the book. If you really expected any sort of long-term resolution to any of the issues that Wally had going on in this book so far, they're not coming here. I know that the 50s of this and Batman seem to have been supposedly these big milestones. The Flash War and Batman and Catwoman's wedding and all that. But the fact is, is that these are coming across like midpoints. Like the conclusions to these arcs are probably going to come maybe a year or two in the future or something along those lines. But here's the thing. It's a Flash story. It's the Speed Force. They ain't got to explain shit. And they don't. But that's okay. I don't need it explained to me necessarily. Because as much as I complain about it being possibly overcomplicated with all these forces being brought in, it's still a fun comic to read. I still love Wally West. I still love the idea that he's still around here. And it's kind of interesting that he basically beats Zoom with the power of memory of family and hope and all that goofy nonsense. But this is DC Comics. This is kind of what I expect. Needless to say, though, it wasn't a bad read. It's just if you're expecting any sort of long-term resolution of anything... Really, all it's doing is setting up more stuff for the future. So, if anything, I would say that I'm going to stick around and see what's going to happen in this, even though I'm not the biggest Barry Allen fan. But as long as Wally's still around, I'll read it. That's really the long and short of it. So, if you're a Flash fan, the series is still good. But if you're not really a fan, this is really not an issue to pick up the series on at all. Amazing Spider-Man number one. Jumping over to Marvel for a second, many of you know this, many of you don't. Spider-Man is my favorite superhero of all time. He is. Not my favorite character, that goes to Venom, but he's definitely my favorite superhero. So, the idea of Ryan Otley drawing this character 
to me is incredible. I love his art style. I'm a big fan of Invincible. I just was a little uneasy with Nick Spencer, also known as Captain White Guilt, writing this book. And you know what? This book is fun. It really is. It's a fun book. It honestly feels like this is what happens when Nick Spencer does not feel like he has to push politics down your throat. Because there are no politics in this book, at least none that I noticed. And it's refreshing. I've heard from people time and time again telling me Nick Spencer is a really talented writer. It's just he feels the need to politic time and again. And the problem with a lot of people out there in the comics realm, really, as I discussed with Chuck Dixon, is they feel the need to do that. And this is what happens when a talented writer does not feel the need to do that, when instead he writes a good comic. Now, for those of you who may have liked some of the things that Dan Slott had done with the character, like giving Peter Parker a PhD and things like that, that sort of thing is starting to get pulled apart, and it's really bringing Peter Parker back to square one. However, there is one positive here. Mary Jane Watson. So, that to me, honestly makes this all worth it, because the one thing that I loved about this book, without spoiling too much, really, is that it had a lot of heart to it. But this is the great thing about getting as much politics out of your writing as you can, or not using your comic as a soapbox. And that is, you can tell some really heartfelt stories, some really interesting stories, because you can just cut loose and have fun with it. So, needless to say, yeah, I recommend this first issue of Amazing Spider-Man. I'm looking forward to the next one, and I never thought I would say that, ever. At least not of a Nick Spencer book. Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps 48 So, another thing some people might not know, I'm a big fan of Green Lantern. That's why it was very hard for me not to fanboy out the first time Ethan Van Skyver and I talked, to say the least, man, because... He and Jeff Johns, as many of you know, basically got Green Lantern to become relevant again after it had sort of stuttered and sputtered and such near the end of the Kyle Rayner run. So, the question that I had before I started reading the series recently was whether or not we would be able to find out if there's anyone else who is capable of really writing a good, solid Green Lantern story not named Jeff Johns, and oddly enough, Robert Venditti has done a great job. It's not as good as Jeff's, but it's still good. This particular issue is the start of the finale of the Dark Star saga. So, Venditti hasn't really focused as much on the emotional spectrum as Jeff Johns did, mostly because that was Jeff Johns' baby. In this one... The Dark Stars have been set up, for better or worse, sort of how, and this calls back to the discussion I had with Chuck Dixon, how Jean-Paul Valley was in Batman Nightfall. You've got the anti-heroes or anti-villains, depending on how you look at it, who go around and kill indiscriminately, and then you've got the Green Lantern Corps, which for better or worse are space cops, and it is basically a battle of ideologies. I really liked the idea of using Tomar Ray, or I'm sorry, not Tomar Ray, Tomar 2, to use as sort of the flagship of the Dark Stars, given the arc that he's gone through within the story. Needless to say, I have to say this about DC Comics. I'm really happy that they did two things with Green Lanterns. They had their diversity comic in Green Lanterns, with, you know, Allahu, Snack Bar, What's-His-Face truck of peace construct guy and uh, triggered girl and then they give us you know the the actual green lanterns in a separate comic so needless to say though this is a good book this is a fun book it's a great action comic it's it's just great sci-fi in general not to mention there is a point where kyle rayner being the unique lantern that he is summoning freaking eva unit one as a construct in this. It's great. I freaking love it. I'm sorry. This this is one of those comics that I gush about. Just because I'm, I've become such a Green Lantern fan over the last decade. And, I don't know. This sort of thing really just excites me for the future of where DC Comics could end up going. If they let some of their writers be as creative as they can be. So, yeah. Definite buy. 
But what I will warn you is this. If you haven't been following Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps up to this point, you probably want to go back about six or seven issues and read through them as well, but I would recommend the entire series thus far. Hunt for Wolverine, Adamantium Agenda number three. It should not take a comic book three issues to tell me something interesting. It shouldn't. This is an issue that I have with comic books in general. Let me just put it this way. Hunt for Wolverine Adamantium Agenda number 3 is okay. Because it's actually got me hooked on an idea. This idea that there was a deal between Wolverine and Iron Man after Civil War. I'm intrigued to know what that deal was. I'm intrigued just in general about it. I'm intrigued by the idea of Mr. Sinister having this giant database of everybody's DNA. You've, you, you've got me at least somewhat interested. But it shouldn't take three issues to do so. Again, credit to Jim Zub and the whole mystery and Madripoor thing. He had me on issue number one. I had to slog through two boring comics to get to the interesting bits. That's not how you sell these things. And this is my problem with decompression in general. And oh, we've got some Because Bendis later. But... This is why I hate decompression. It's writing for trades. Well, some of us want to read a good story every month. Pardon me for that. I guess I'm the asshole being a customer who's been reading comic books for the better part of his life and wanting something every month that wets my whistle. Nope, fuck me, apparently. I mean, it's bad enough that I'm a, that I'm a conservative. It's bad enough that that makes me a sexist, racist, bigot, homophobe if you ask half of Marvel staff. But Jesus Christ, now I can't even get a consistent comic book from you. Fuck. Yeah, moving on. Champions number 22. So last we left Champions a few episodes ago, I remember saying a statement along the lines that if Jim Zub really stretches his legs and starts to get a pace with this particular book and he allows these young heroes to start to be their own thing, he could end up turning champions into Marvel's Teen Titans and he could be the type of writer to do it. I was right. Hashtag Micah was right, I guess. So, I have to say this. This is not a decompressed comic. This is allowing for Amadeus Cho and Riri Williams and all of these other characters to breathe, to be their own people. This, for better or worse, is what Teen Titans was under Marv Wolfman. Now, there's one thing that I kind of noticed. Amadeus Cho's outfit looks almost exactly like Beast Boy's. <laughs> it's just a different color palette. So, but needless to say, though, he, he has his own thing now. He's not the Hulk anymore. Iron Heart is not Iron Man. She, you know, Riri is her own thing now. So on and so forth. And they are allowing these sorts of things to happen. On top of that, there is character consistency here. And there's some drama in there. Some soft drama that I really enjoy about this. And some bonds that are being made between these characters bit by bit, issue by issue. Again, which is what Marv Wolfman did with the Teen Titans back in the day. And there's reasons that I'm making that cons you know, that comparison here. is because Marv Wolfman, as a Teen Titans writer, was the kind of guy who would not feel like he needed to rush anything, nor did he really feel like he needed to stretch a story out. He had it perfectly planned, issue by issue, and had enough content within each issue to keep you reading. We saw that with the last thing that I had seen Champions Oriented, the Infinity Countdown, which I didn't review, but I will say is worth reading. And then this as well. On top of that, what, what kind of saddens me is there is a possibility that we might see, spoilers, the death of Vision. And that is depressing. Going from Tom King's run on the book to... You know, Mark Wade basically fucking it up. And then to now, it's unfor unfortunate just to see this character that I've been following for so long from Avengers to West Coast Avengers to now. Just, it's, yeah, it's, it's, 
there's there's some moments on this that legitimately kind of kind of tugged on me a little bit. I felt bad for for Sam, you know, Nova Junior, basically, um, you know, losing his powers and so on and so forth. And yeah, there's there's something organic about this comic that wasn't there before with Mark Wade. And there's a lot to the story. There's different levels. It's setting up the next conflict very well. And not to mention, the interesting thing is, is that Jim Zub has seen all of these characters, these basically junior characters from the SJW Marvel era, I guess you could call it, and is really giving them the depth that they could have had. And I won't lie, the final bit of the issue, the reveal of the next conflict, once you see what that thing is... I hate to use a meme here, but you'll shit bricks. Because it tells you something about Viv, and it tells you about the kind of threats that these characters are going to encounter from here on in. I've gone from doing a series called Why Marvel's Champions Sucks to I'm looking forward to the next issue. That's insane. But, fuck man, this was a good comic. Definitely recommended. Definitely Recommended. I'm looking forward to more from Jim Zub. Superman number one. Yes, the moment you've all been waiting for. Get your drinks ready, because it is coming. Oh my god. So, before this, and before the Man of Steel miniseries, Superman was a good comic. Yeah, and I'm not even a Superman fan. Patrick Gleason and Peter Tomasi's Superman was just great and deserves every ounce of your money. This crap, on the other hand, certainly does not. Why? Because Bendis. And oh my god, this comic Bendis is harder than any Bendis has ever Bendis. And that, that's saying something. Because you gotta keep in mind, I've read New Avengers. I've read Dark Avengers, or Dank Avengers, or whatever you want to call it. I've wa- I've read a ton of Bendis books. Oh, jeez. So, there's a good chunk of this, where Superman is basically monologuing to himself in space while stopping a potential invasion of Earth. Then he goes home, and he recalls these conversations with Lois, And then he lays there. Then he recalls these conversations with his son, and he sits there. And that's basically the long and short of the first part of it. And why the fuck did you even let them go in the first place? This is not... This is not Superman, alright? This is one thing I don't understand. Why on earth did you fucking let your father, who literally came back out of nowhere after you thought he was dead, and you don't really know why he came back, or why he disappeared again, and why he's back again... And you, you didn't stop him from taking your son when you're fucking Superman! But that's the problem. Bendis Superman is not Superman. Because Bendis. This Superman is Cuckman. Because Bendis. I had a bold prediction that I said some time ago. That I have a feeling that Superman is going to cheat on Lois Lane. And for those of you who are offended by that statement. You know what? I am going to change my position. I don't think that Superman is going to cheat on Lois Lane. I am hoping, hoping, just because this is Bendis and I want him to set fire to the world to make this even worth it, I hope that Lois cheats on Superman with Hal Jordan. Because fuck you, that's why. I hate this fucking comic. Because Bendis. There's a joke in here. That gets repeated three times while he's talking to John Jones. Of... Oh, I hear a trouble thing, so I'm going to go hit and punch and blah 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 because I'm Superman, and isn't this funny? I did it three times. Oh, and don't mind the weed and speak, because Bendis. Like, uh, and on top of that, it, it feels like Jean's conversation makes it seem like he's wanting Superman to become a benevolent tyrant or something, which is so out of character. It's just, what the fuck, Bendis? Have you ever read a Martian Manhunter comic before? Ever? Jesus Christ, John Ostrander did an amazing series. Can't you take ten minutes to go and read it? Or does something about being Brian Michael Bendis mean you only have three hours in the day to wake up and pen some sort of crap? 
Oh, God, this comic is painful. At least Ivan Race's artwork is good, but just, it's it's a mess, and it's fucking drawn out and decompressed, and then suddenly you're in the Phantom Zone, and Rogal, what the fuck, is coming back, and I hate Cuckman! I hate him! Bring back Superman! Superman was a good comic! That was fun! This isn't fun! Nothing happens until the very end! And then you think that something is going to happen after that and the comic fucking ends! Fuck you, Brian Michael Bendis! Because Bendis! Jesus Christ! <sighs> comic books are serious business. So that's it for the Comics Crusade this week. I hope your liver's still intact after all of that. Yeah. Again, if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. If you're not getting notifications and you heard about this video from someone else, please bookmark the page or hit the little notification bell so you'll be notified of the next particular video. We will be back, of course, next week. And hopefully we'll have other stuff on top of that and we can get this whole issue of you getting my videos resolved. But until that time... My name is Micah Curtis. Welcome to my crusade. Dave's fault. <laughs>